Well, good morning, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to another lockdown live stream here from the Smart Energy Lab and with a bunch of guests from the industry. Yeah, and a really big thanks to all the guests this week uh, on Monday and Tuesday. It's, it's great how <laughs> lockdown brings people together a bit from well, actually all around Australia, not just in uh, Victoria. Um, some of us are still working, some of us um, not so much working, but uh, all working from home and uh, it makes for interesting time. So this is kind of just a chance to have a really casual bit of a chat with industry people, learn some stuff. If you happen to be stuck at home or at a loose end or just want to learn stuff, uh, that's kind of what this uh, live stream is all about. So today I've got a few guests um, that are going to drop in. There's, there's really a very informal kind of arrangement here, but I'd like to let you know that you can ask questions of my guests and that's done by using whatever um, live stream format you're using. Uh, use the uh, comment field or the chat window and uh, you can type your questions in there. Also, if you're, a, if you're a brave sausage and you actually want to come in live and ask your question, you can do that. And so I'll, I'll just drop that into the chat. So um, uh, I'll, this is where you can ask your questions live. I'm just typing it in. Ask questions live via video. But you will need a video, you know, like your phone or a computer or something like that. Um, and you can just click on that link and you'll go into what's called the green room where you can uh, you know, be watching and listening the show and I can see you there and I can just say I'll bring you in and say would you like to ask your question. So there you go. Ask your questions in the chat. Ask them live if you're feeling brave and uh, uh, keep this uh, conversation going. Anyway. I've got a couple of guests sitting in the green room. Um, we've got Ivan from Cleanergy and we've got Paul Wilson uh, from RVO Australia. So Paul, I'll just bring him on. Paul, here we go. Hey, Glenn, how are you? Yeah, good, thanks, Paul. Good, good to have you on the show. Great, you too. <laughs> so you you're, too. Uh, you've moved factory, I believe. Yeah, we just moved literally on Friday, uh, running out of space in the old place. And it's good timing for us. So, yeah, much more space now. And the guys are thoroughly enjoying working in a, a much larger warehouse. Well, maybe you should tell the audience a little bit about RVO Australia and what you do. Uh, we design and build energy storage systems. And we do solar projects as well. But our main product is sort of software and energy storage. Uh, we also have a background in passive house design and passive house consulting where we look at the whole building envelope and how efficient it is based on insulation and airflow and air changes and thermal bridges and all of these things that make a high performance building as the old saying goes it's easier to save a what than to make a what maybe it's not the case anymore but it's if we can save as much as we can and make as much as we can and store as much as we can we get a good outcome so passive house it's a it's a german word isn't it h-a-u-s yeah, is H-A-U-S, passive house basically it's um Typically, you need to remove about 90% of the energy load from a heating and cooling plant on a building to pass. So a normal building might require 100 watts of energy per square metre of cooling plant size, and our target is 10 watts per square metre. And consequently, you can air condition a house with a 10 kilowatt air conditioner rather than a 30 kilowatt or a 40 kilowatt unit that you might normally need. Right. Okay. So, yeah, a, 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 a what saved is a what you didn't have to generate. I call them the neg negawatts, the what you ne never needed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's a really good principle uh, of design is uh, is energy efficiency. I often, you know, just quote the fact that the evidence shows that efficiency is the cheapest option. It's the the first uh, fuel basically is energy efficiency. It definitely is. Yeah, and there's lots of ways to think about it. Um, for example, I was looking at heat pumps the other day thinking, how do I do better than a heat pump? Because a heat pump eventually will break because it's a motor and it's a compressor and it has a limited life. And I thought a resistive element really is the best way to heat water because <laughs> it just if you get the right one, it'll last forever. But the problem is it's inefficient. So I found this product through Passive House, which is a, um, a drain hot water recovery unit. And what happens is as the water rushes down the drain as you're showering, the cold water coming uh, toward the shower heater unit is actually going through a coil that recovers the heat from the drain water and reheats the water coming back into the tank. I thought, oh, that's a good idea. So basically when you turn the shower on, the first 
10 seconds is inefficient if you're using instantaneous electric, for example. But then after a minute or so, that pipe heats up to 32 degrees, which is your waste heat, which means you're only adding five degrees to it with an electric heater to get it up to shower temperature. So then you can use instantaneous electric to heat for your shower instead of a tank, which is much more reliable than a heat pump. So there's, there's lots of ways to look at how to do something that aren't normally traditionally acceptable. That's just one example. Wow, that's, I've never heard of that one. Recover, heat recovery from, from your drain. Wow. It's, it's, it's standard in passive houses in Germany. That's how they wow. recover. That's because it's so much more efficient than throwing all that heat away into the mm. drain. You recover it to heat the water coming in. They also do it with air as well, bringing fresh air in yep. and preheating it with the uh, exhaust air. That's a HRV, heat recovery ventilator. So we do yep. the same thing. It's about 92% efficient to do that with air. Um, with water, I think it's like 80 or 90%, depending on the brand that you buy. I remember reading about the the French um, government's uh, facility in Antarctica, which they designed as a, a super energy efficient building. It's so energy efficient, so well insulated in the coldest part of the planet that um, people are one of the main heating sources. So basically, yeah. feeding people keeps the building warm. Yes, that's passive house rule: is you have to add the occupants as a heat source. <laughs> So your television, your, your, your toaster, your kettle, it's all added into the calculation for heating because just people living in the building is enough to heat it in many cases. Yeah, cool. Yeah. So, um, look, um, Paul and I have known each other for, for a long time in this industry and we've done a few projects together. Um, I've seen you go from doing, you know, rooftop solar, then battery storage, then scaling that up to, you know, utility scale, basically doing those really big projects. So um, how's all that going? Yeah, it's going well. We've got a few big projects on at the moment. Uh, we're in the middle of uh, energizing the Great Stupa, which is the, I think it's the largest Buddhist temple in the Southern Hemisphere, I think. It's in Bendigo. You can Google it. It's enormous. That's a brand new Buddhist structure. And that's what Stupa means. It means temple, I think, in the language that they use for when you're talking about Buddhism. And, um, it's a beautiful big building and they're wanting to energize the whole site and Manny had two-phase swirl line available and they approached us um, and we're providing them with the two-phase to three-phase conversion using SP Pros to bring the energy in from the swirl line and then we're grid forming three-phase inside using a DC bus and um, then we're adding or the clients adding a hundred kilowatt solar uh, ground mount array which they I think they want some got some money through a grant program to do that so I'll end up with a 50 kilowatt supply from PowerCore and 100 kilowatt from PV. And then the whole resort like units and apartments are being all built, will be powered off this um, backbone. So it's, yeah, that's a good project we're in the middle of right now. And we're just finishing off one up in Queensland for a coal power station, which is being solar powered to power all our admin buildings. Same, same process where diesel's the energy source and it'll be changed over to PV and uh, energy storage. Maybe you should build something for the Kellard um, power station in Queensland that just caught fire. It's, yeah, that was a big problem up there. No one was hurt. I was talking to the uh, one of the managers there. So nobody was injured, which is good. Yeah, yeah, that was pretty massive. Um, yeah, so uh, that's actually taking a, a, a restricted supply such as two-phase SWIR um, and creating a you know high-quality, high-power using inverters is exactly something we talked about yesterday with Lindsay Hart from Selectronic. Um, it does seem to yeah. be kind of like a new market, which is uh, competing against network upgrades. Well, that was the, the, the quote they got from PowerCore was obscene. And this was not. So it's better and cheaper and more reliable because you have the grid as a supply. And then secondarily, you have the SP Pro grid forming, and then you have a generator as well on site as a failover. So there's three energy sources sitting there, plus the PV, obviously. Um, but what we're doing for this size, we're giving them five-phase power. You ever heard of five-phase power? <laughs> so the first two phases come through and obviously provide two single-phase feeds to power some of the site, and the other um, three phases produce pure three phases, a, a, th a tr traditional three phase. So end up with five phases of power. So we called it phase A, phase B, phase one, phase two, phase three, just so there was no no mess up on site. You better color code and label things well on the switchboard. Yep. <laughs> yes, we've learned a lot about that lately. We've, we've been taken through the ringers with our coal power station project where the engineers and the client and the standards they need you to meet for all your drawings 
and everything else is very very high which has been great like it's forcing us to take it to the next level with drawings and labeling and uh, knowing every standard required to be compliant with mining codes and grid codes and off-grid codes and everything so yeah it's good to be taken through the room like that i think yeah yeah sometimes clients are your best teachers because they ask yes. for you know these things and you've got to find out how to do it exactly yep mm -hmm. yeah, cool um, so the other thing that Avio make, which uh, I was pretty excited, uh, is the ultra capacitor battery, the UCB. Yeah. Um, how's that going? And tell us a bit about it. Great. Yeah, we're doing a lot of projects. The guys are out in the warehouse now manufacturing. Um, we basically build two sizes, a 2.2 kilowatt hour, which is now 2.5 as of the next shipment. So a 2.5 kilowatt hour model and a 6 kilowatt hour model. Um, and you can have them in any voltage from sort of 2.3 volts through to 147 volts so you basically can buy any size mod any any voltage you want in any pack and then you can series connect or parallel depending on your your, your need for power and uh, energy so um, we've been deploying those for about maybe two years now and they've been extraordinarily reliable we've had i think one fault somewhere which was a more of an installation fault than it was a product fault um, but apart from that, there have been no uh, repairs required of any modules. Um, and they're extremely powerful. So like a 2.2 kilowatt hour module can charge it in 10 minutes and uh, produces power of around 40 kilowatts. So they're very useful for peaking plants and uh, projects where you want to store energy very fast and um, very high round trip efficiency. So there's almost no losses in the in the product when you charge and discharge you lose almost no energy right so in the same form factor you can do a whole range of pack voltages yeah we've got an 18.4 volt model which we released just recently um 13.8 so 18.4 is good because three in series makes 55 volts which is perfect for many 48 volt systems and it's only then maybe seven kilowatt hours of storage which is a good size for a small project um, the design life is 20 years and we now offer a 20-year warranty if it's under a maintenance contract as well. So people can buy a battery that lasts a long time, which obviously is good for recyclability, not having to worry about you know, repairing it or replacing it in a short term. Right. Now, um, before we went live on air, you and I were discussing some design software that you use. Um, but yeah. what I want to actually do is not not show it yet. I've got one more guest in the in the green room sure. who uh, I should introduce. Um, so I might just pop you back into the green room if you don't mind, Paul. But I'd love to come yeah. and talk a bit about the uh, design software that you use. Okay, sure. Okay, cool. So my next guest is Ivan from Clenergy. So Ivan, I'm just going to bring you on. Thumbs up if you're ready. There we go. Cool. And I better put the right caption there. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so, Hi, Glenn. How, how are you going? going? Good. I'm great. Not so, wearing your uh, Glenergy t-shirt today? My Glenergy t-shirt. That's right. The one where my seven-year-old hacked the, 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 the lettering C into a G. Yep. <laughs> no, that was good. I think we've got to make that into a full production soon. <laughs> oh, well, I'll, I'll be up there because uh, it's a good one. <laughs> Um, yeah, so um, Ivan, whereabouts are you at the moment? Melbourne. You're in stuck Melbourne. at home. You are stuck at home. Yeah, right. So just to kind of give a little introduction to Ivan, I met Ivan um, when he came out here to the Smart Energy Lab for a, a very fun project that uh, their marketing team led by Samir did, which was to uh, just show how strong some of their products were. So the, the universal clamp, we had this tug of war. Wasn't that fun? Yeah, that's right. That was really, really fun. <laughs> and the and the music video we made after that, I don't know if you saw that one yet. Sean uh, rapping. No, I haven't. I haven't. I'll yes, have that's that a one. music video. <laughs> <laughs> I must admit, when Samir pitched it to me, I was pretty skeptical. I was thinking it's going to be dull. We're going to see some chains, pull a clamp, and it's going to break. But what actually we saw was my four-wheel drive, spinning all yeah, four yeah. wheels <laughs> your four wheel drive spinning all wheels and the clamp not breaking and i go this can't be true <laughs> and the and the dust <laughs> it was like a scene out of a movie or something <laughs> and uh, i got into trouble because the clamps right the clamps are just aluminium oh yeah yeah you did 
<laughs> yeah, he's saying, you broke the crust on the road. We spent so much time trying to pack it down. But anyway, <laughs> we, we tidied it up with a rake and, yeah, that was pretty good. Yeah, we did. That's right. <laughs> so, look, when I was thinking about, um, you know, what Clean Energy have done, I actually remember when, um, uh, it was, is it Mario, who one of the founders? Um, yes. Yep. He came to my classroom at Swinburne. So I used to teach at Swinburne TAFE oh, and wow. uh, Mario came to present to my students. And um, I, I remember thinking, gee, ah, a pre-designed mounting system. That's That's got to be something radical because back then people were doing some terrible things. Look, look I'm going to bring a picture in for you. Um, um, this, this is a mounting system from 2010, I think. Wow. And when I say system, it's called go to the local <laughs> hardware store, buy some box section aluminium, uh, some flat strip aluminium and some tech screws and just screw it all together as best you can with a few dobs of silicon for good measure. So what's what what, what is it sitting on? What's what's that base? It's just the a piece base of is, is 25 mil box section aluminium. Oh, wow. OK. And actually, it's not screwed to the roof at all. They just put a few dobs of silicon to keep it in place. That is amazing. That is it still there? <laughs> well, I, I don't think it is because um, I actually inspected. I used to do inspections for the Clean Energy Council and the Australian Greenhouse Office, and uh, uh, we saw quite a few from the same company. Sometimes they forgot to even put the uh, clamps in, so the the panels were gravity mounted. They're just sitting on oh the roof. Oh my! That is amazing. That is <laughs> yeah. amazing. I think I've got another one here. Hang on. Self self made ballast system. And, and this is a school um, environment center in Sydney, about the same date, around about 2009, I think. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was also how mounting systems used to be made. Look, to tell you the truth, I used to make my own because you couldn't buy good stuff. There wasn't anything yep. there. People would just go and get angle and bolt it together and do their best without engineering. But You'll, you'll be surprised a lot, of the, a lot of the ground mounts still look like that. Like, you know, it's got beams uh, and, and purlins going cross-sectional and stuff. Yeah. So we haven't re evolved a lot from that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, yeah. The, um, this is DIY tiles. Um, oh bracket. wow, that is amazing. <laughs> look at that rubber washer come just coming off already. You're looking at the galvanic isolation, I can see. Yep, yep. <laughs> <laughs> it's a hot topic. Yeah, actually, this is something I, I did want to just chat to you a little bit about because uh, you, you kind of caught me on the hop. I'll just take a picture off screen. Hang on, where are we? Um, is that I remember when I saw the universal um, clamp and it didn't come with a uh, EPDM kind of membrane washer mm. or anything. It was just aluminium clamping onto to, to the, the zinc loom roof. And I was thinking, oh, you can't do that. You've got to have... You've got to have that sort of barrier. And then you explained to me that actually there's a lot of physics, a lot of science in middle earth. A lot of which... science, yeah. A mm. lot of chemistry. <laughs> and um, yeah. Tell us about it. Yeah, so I mean, well, I mean, we're always learning, right? I mean, to put it in a sense, solar is still relatively new in, in the world. We're still learning as we go, not just structurally, but also with the, the chemistry, with the metals and how it works. So what we found was... Um, Okay, so there's two types of corrosion that we deal with. One is atmospheric corrosion and one is galvanic corrosion in, in solar anyway. Um, atmospheric corrosion is, you know, you get that, you know, near your coastal areas or industrial areas when there's contaminants in the air. And galvanic corrosion happens when there's two dissimilar metals in contact with each other and with a few accelerators in, in, in place like, um, like a liquid or temperature. Um, and also the, the, the difference between the two metals, that's very important, the electrode potential difference between the two metals. So what we found was um, the, the interfaces that we use is aluminum base and the, and, and the roof, roofing sheets that is mounted on, that it's certified that we have a list of uh, roofs that you can uh, install it on, are made from blue scope steel. Right, whether it's whether it's a Lysart brand or Stratcore or Fielders, the base material is produced by Blue Scope, and Blue Scope produces two types of roofing sheets. One is zinc loom or color bond. All right, so these these are the two type of roofing sheets that are used on your Lysart four hundred six, your seven hundred, your clip blocks, and all those different different brands. Um, basically, what Lysart and Fielders do is that they take these roofing sheets and they make it their own, right? Their own profile, their own engineering, but the material is the same. So we found that 
our aluminum clamp and zinc loom or collarbone are actually considered similar because the coating on zinc loom and uh, collarbone is 50% aluminum and the rest is made of a uh, zinc magnesium alloy. So when you look at when you look at this this metals, I actually have it up on my screen if you let me to share it. Yeah, go for it. Share screen. There we go. Oops, I had a few other slides that I wouldn't show. All right, so this this is what we're talking about. So when you look at, so there's two ways of identifying where your metals are uh, dissimilar or similar. So you can look at A on the on the metals chart. So this this list shows you how noble or how passive your metal is compared to how reactive your metal is. And the further it is on this list, it's there's a high chance of galvanic corrosion. So where we have our clamps, which is aluminium, and then you have your your zinc loom and your colorborne roofing sheets are all right next to each other so when when metals are this close to each other they're considered similar and the risk of galvanic corrosion is very very i mean every every metal will undergo corrosion whether it's in five years 20 25 years it will eventually corrode you can't prevent that but what we do is we try to limit that corrosion to allow it to live through its design life so we've got our clamps here. We've got the roofing sheets here. As you can see, they're very, very, very close to each other. But if you want to go in something a bit more technical, we have two standards that we can look at. Not AU standards, but these are the only two standards that even remotely talk about this stuff. One is the UL2703 and the European Standard 199-1. So in this standard, it actually gives you the electrode potential difference between the two metals. So if it's less than 0 0.6, it's minimal galvanic corrosion. So you've got our aluminium clamps here, and then you've got the roofing sheets there. So as you can see, it's 0 0.35, so it's not even close to 0 0.6. So, and then we've also got very common with our, with our mounting systems is you've got aluminium and um, stainless steel. So you've got 305 and uh, so what do you got there? Yeah, so, so basically aluminum stainless steel is under 0 0.6, aluminum and zinc coated steel under 0 0.6, and aluminum uh, al magnesium alloy is under 0 0.6 as well. So yeah, so that's that's how we determine that, you know, you don't need to have rubber separation between the two clamps and the roofing sheet. Right, okay, that's that's a really good explanation. Um, I, I, I can see now there's a lot more uh, science uh, to this than just, you know, dissimilar metals, uh, you need to have a barrier. You need to understand all of those, you know, um, the chemical uh, relationships, and as you said, the environmental ones as well. And, and mm -hmm, unfortunately, mm -hmm. that's something that really f falls into an engineering department, which is what Clinergy does. You do the mechanical Correct, engineering, yeah. you do the metallurgy, you come up with the solutions, and you certify the product. That's right. That's right. We're, we're definitely evolving into a lot more than just being a manufacturer or supplier. Um, when Clenergy actually first started in 2007, the R&D marketing was all from here, and then eventually you got moved overseas, obviously to uh, expenses and costs and stuff like that. But as of two years ago, a lot of that is being bought back here. So R&D, marketing, our IT is all um, based in AU. Um, and also you're, you're involved with some of our R&D meetings as well, as you know. So a lot of that now is being created from AU. A lot of the ideas, the product creation is all done, done from feedback from the field from here. Yeah, that's great. So actually, Clenergy's grown from being, you know, just an Australian company to an international company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a lot, a lot's been happening, and it's really exciting to be part of this company. Now, we've got a couple of questions from our audience, which is great. I'm going to bring these on screen. So we've got um, Louis. He's asking, does drip corrosion cause problems, carbon dioxide from the air? Yeah, so these are things that ac accelerate cor uh, gravitic corrosion. So where there's a, there's a, um, where the solvents so rain um water and also contaminants in it so carbon dioxide is one of them but because because the metals are so similar uh, and they're so they're well under 0 0.6 volts those those accelerators will not increase it and it will still uh survive its design life which is 25 years that's the interface and also the roofing sheet 
And also, uh, actually, to just add on that, I also had one more slide, which is actually really good to share. And this is actually from uh, Lysart themselves. So this is Blue Scope created this, and Lysart made it their own. And um, where is it? Oops, did I close it? We've got a few seconds. more questions coming in too, which I'll follow up with from Kyle. So welcome back, Kyle. All right. So this screen here, this page here, can we see this? Yep, Gosh. there it is. I'll make it slightly bigger. So this is from, from Lysa uh, themselves, their install guide. So here they, they mention the compatibility of direct contact between metals and alloys. And this is around... Um, fasteners and accessories, mainly designed for flashing and guttering, but we use this for our solar mounting as well. So if you can look here, these are all the roofing sheets that they have, zinc alum, color bond, and then we have uh, the fasteners or the materials that can come in direct contact with the roof. So we have aluminum alloys, and as you can see, yes, 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 this is for majority of them. And we also, actually, this is actually good to point out, we have a few uh, roofing sheets that you can't have it. And these roofing sheets are only installed in C5 areas, really coastal areas. So Colorborn uh, or, or Lysart recommends to install these type of roofing sheets in those really, really, really high corrosive areas. And, and with, this, with this type of roofing sheet, stainless and with aluminum, the reason why it's not compatible, even though they're still similar, is because the pollutants in the air and the, and the salt accelerates the corrosion under its design life, under 25 years. Right. So there's actually a follow-up question. This one's from Kyle, um, and he's asking, it's, it's kind of in two parts. So Kyle's is asking here, um, do you need to have a different chemistry in wetter locations? And then he goes on to say, uh, like the Amazon or Pacific Northwest. Yeah, yeah. So those those numbers that we we mentioned is purely for Australia. So that's the we 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 understand the accelerators within the Australian corrosion standards, but I think um, in other areas, even in C five in Australia, that that has that impacts the design life. So that's when we need to you need to look at either using the IO nines or the I thirty twos, which have a rubber, which can slow down galvanic corrosion. It, eventually, it will happen, especially in those areas but which we're trying to limit that under 25 years. Great. Okay. Um, here's another one. I actually wasn't quite sure what the question was, but I think that one of the other audience members informed me, what's your view on 5G? Now we're not talking about 5G <laughs> um, internet. <laughs> uh, as in what's 5G? Fifth generation, I think is what they're referring to. So is this uh, fifth generation materials? Well, standards. Oh, I'm not sure. Okay, well, if you, none of us are sure, maybe the questioner could give a little bit more information on that one. Um, so <laughs> we're not mind readers here, but uh, thank you for for asking the question. We'll 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 wait for the clarification on that one. Um, so Ivan, actually, I'm going to shuffle people around a little bit. So we've actually got um, Paul in in the green room, and he's going to show us some um, some easy to use design software for um, doing system, you know three D stuff. Um, so I'll just shuffle you back into the, the green. No room worries. Mind, Ivan. Cool. No problem. You ready, Paul? Okay. Bringing Paul back. Here we go. Hi. Hi. Now I can uh, tell me when you're ready to share your screen. Cause, um, I can do it now. Oh, it's already shared, I think, is it? Well, it looks like you've got an overlay of us on the screen. So hang on, let me just, uh, you probably need to share the window as opposed to your whole screen. Uh, what I'll do is I'll share that screen. And I'll just move you over here. There you go. Okay. My other screen. Is that working yep. now? Beautiful. Yep. Okay, so I just want to thought I'd show everyone that this, this program that I use, and I've been using it for a long time, it's called ARCAD. And you can buy it from this company called DesignSoft Online. That's their website. It's just like about, I think it's $600, so it's a pretty reasonable cost. It's not a full-blown CAD package like Revit or, you know, Design Builder or anything, but it lets you quickly and easily model a building. So what I've done here is I've just picked up a, a house. I'll just quick, do you want me to show you how it works, Glenn? You there? Hello? Uh, sorry, I, I just sorry. dropped off so you could uh, have more screen real estate. Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> but go for it, um, yes. Yeah, okay, I'll show you how it works. So basically, if you find a house that you want to 
build in 3D. I've just picked up a house here in Mitchell Street somewhere. I don't know where it is. Um, then um, you just draw, draw a measurement line on the side of it to get a, a scale and then just take a screenshot of it. So we'll just do that now. So let's just pick a house here randomly. Um, where's a nice little house? It looks good. So let's just say we want to do this house here with a chimney on it. Then we'll just take a um, right click and do measure distance and just put a line here down the side so we can scale the picture. And then take a screenshot. A good short, shortcut for screenshots is Shift Windows S if you don't know it. Take that one there. And then go into Word. This is what I do here. Just rotate it so it's sort of north facing. It's easier to build it if it's square. So just rotate it till it's north. And take another screenshot. Shape of the house. It's pretty poor image quality, but it doesn't matter. And then I come across to here and I'll start a, um, a new file. Okay, I'll just call it Q. And I'm just going to paste this image here into the screen. Okay, and then I'm just going to scale it. So you just do dynamic scaling and you measure from here to here and type in the actual length of the line, which is 19.84. Okay, then you start. So there's, there's the shape of my building. I'll just draw a wall system around it. So you just grab a wall tool here and draw some a square wall. And then another wall in here to get that cut out and then join it i'm just doing this quickly so you can see how easy it is to use a program and build a 3d house rather than just sticking panels on a, a plan using a, a 2d plan model once you've got the wall right you just choose the roof designer tool and it automatically builds a roof based on what it sees based on the walls but you can see on the left hand side here it's actually a gable wall so we'll set that to gable over here and we'll reduce the eaves a little bit. And the pitch of the roof is probably 25 degrees being that area. Done. So now if we look at it in 3D here, there you go. There's a 3D roof that we just built based on that house. Now what you can do from there is you can start putting solar panels on it. So I'll just shrink that down a little bit so it fits on the same window. Yeah. And um, I put them into the skylight tool here. I made a set of my own solar panel sizes that suited what I like to use and then just rotate it put them on the roof here okay and you can see there if I go back to the 3d image there they are on the roof wow wow that was impressive as <laughs> now how long did that take me about three or three minutes to do a 3d house with solar panels on it yeah, I think I've opened AutoCAD a few times and just closed it again. Uh, no, it's too, it's too hard. And this is just it's too you, can, hard. you can change it to a you know a hidden line drawing or a line drawing if you prefer it. You know, yeah, you can you can export this. This is really cool. Watch this. Actually, what I'll do firstly is I'll just close that for a minute. I'll open up a um, a recent drawing which I was which I had open. Open. We've actually got a question from someone in the green room. Um, yep. John asked, does the software just assume a roof angle is 30 degrees? No, no, I just I set the angle. Okay, thanks. Okay, so I'm going to open up a luxury house that's been drawn. This is more detailed. See that? Yeah. Pull that up in 3D here. It's got furniture and vehicles and everything in there. Okay, there it is there. Now, if I wanted to extend that house a bit, let's say, let's say I want to put solar panels on this house. So first I'll just choose the roof tool, automatically choose a roof wall, go to the level, second level, click on roof tool, automatic. And there, that's, it picked up the, the wall line as the roof line. Is the angle that I want. I don't ask about the angle. I'm going to put one, one degree in here 
and then from there I'll, I'll make it a oh, I'll get rid of some put some gabled walls in here as well so it's more of a flat roof oh okay so I just made a small roof section there and then I can pick up go back to 3d again you see my roof there sitting on top of the building and then I can choose my panels and put my number of panels on there here you go and there's my panels on my roof now I can do tilted panels I can build my own models so I can go into this section here which is a modeling tool and I can just draw a panel like this and tell it the size of the panel so it might be you know you might have a certain size panel you use 2.050 by 1040 by a thickness of 40 mil here's my panel over here it's like a 3d designer i can just replicate that a few times mm -hmm. so i can um, multiply it I want to multiply it every 1.06 so it's got a gap for the mid clamps i want to have say in brackets there you go there's my array and then i just insert that into the library there and then that once it's inserted in the library it, it comes up in the um in that list of tools over here so you can build your own panels you can tilt them you can change the color and then you can put them on a house here so if i want to put some landscape around this place I could put some grass on the ground, just draw a slab. And um, from there I can um, add ground mount arrays. So here I've got some ground mount arrays I've drawn. So panels, I made some ground mount arrays here. Really good for doing a solar farm. So you might have a satellite photo of a paddock and you want to do a solar farm that looks impressive for your client. You can rotate it a bit here. And then you might want to replicate it so you go edit multiplication serialize it and then have say five copies of it in the well, x direction the, the, the resolution uh, is a bit low for those fine details so we, we're kind see. of we see the 3d much better but I, i'm getting the perspective now yeah. so you, you just um created you a panel created a ground mount replicated it yeah and you can Pitch it, pitch it up and do oh there we go can you make yeah. the 3d a bit bigger so that's actually probably that's more visually yeah. um, um, uh, easy to see for us yeah. yeah wow that that was pretty impressive um, <laughs> wow it's a really good well, tool so it's, it's inexpensive it's easy to use and here's the really clever thing if you click on this little cloud button here it actually produces a 3d HTML model that you can send your client and they can spin it around so that blows their socks off when they get that in their email is the design because you, you took a satellite photo, you drew some walls, you made a 3D roof, you threw some panels on it, put a front door on a car in the driveway maybe, inverter on the wall, took you maybe 20 minutes, maybe an hour on your first go. When you get good at it, you can do it in about 10 minutes and then you send them a 3D HTML file which can be opened in any browser and it just converts it to a rotatable 3D file. So I put a link to the software there. Um, we just to disclaimer: neither of us are involved in this company. We just I don't it's sell a great it. Tool. No, it's yep. a good, it's a good tool, and you can buy it. And there's no license. There's no ongoing use fee, which is a big thing. So a lot yeah. of the time, these programs you have to pay every year for them. This one you don't. So yeah. So I'll, I'll save this model here. Thing. Save open model, and there it is. Wow, yes. so yeah. that's what you would send the client as an HTML um, and they yeah. can rotate around. Rotate it, they can zoom through it, they can look in the house or the furniture if you want to look at it. <laughs> so for 600 bucks, it's a great tool. Once you've done all of that hard work, if you want to have a real draftsman do it in AutoCAD, you can export it as a DXF file and yeah. send it to them saying, can you please make this a proper engineering drawing and the, yep. the starting point for them is so much better than they would if they just start from scratch where you've drawn it on a piece of paper or something or in a word in a word file <laughs> wow well i've never seen this before uh i'm you just blew me away that's amazing look i want to yeah. bring um ivan back in with you so we're going to discuss a bit about designing good, mounting good, systems good one. So I, ivan could give it away with his um solar panel wrecking maybe <laughs> Well, let me just uh, bring Ivan back in for a second. Here we go, because uh, 
and uh, I'll just lay us around a bit better. There we go. So um, thank, thanks for that amazing demonstration, Paul. Um, you are obviously very proficient, but I could see that it wasn't really that complex once you've done it a couple of times. Yeah. No, it, it is easy to use. Uh, like I've tried, I've got a copy of a program called BricsCAD, which is an AutoCAD clone, which I use for making DXF files. And it's very much about lines and angles and things, whereas this is really you just build parts and assemble it. And it's really designed to quickly build a 3D building and models that you can sort of bring together and show what you're trying to get done all to scale. And then from there, you push it out to the, the experts. I think it's a good in, in, intermediate stage. Right. So question for Ivan, um, how does your customers deal with, you know, d d design? Is there any solutions that you're familiar with? Oh, I uh, can't hear you. Somehow you've got muted, Ivan. Yep, sorry, that was me. <laughs> okay. um, I don't know if you remember, Glenn, back in the day, Cleanergy did have uh, a tool called PV Easy Design. I remember playing it in my first year in Clean Energy, and it was it was similar, but not to that advanced and how pretty that one looks. So we 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 could create um, 3D models of uh, buildings, and then lay put panels on it, and it was obviously tailored towards Clean Energy racking. So you put you know your Clean Energy mounting system, and it spits out a bomb for you, which was really cool. But it was really really at the time really expensive to maintain, and we weren't getting a lot of users uh, that time as well. So we stopped that, and then we moved to more of just an online bomb tool called easy quote uh, where you can just plug in the data of your um, your project and where it is and then you can create a bomb so create the materials that you need for your project um, that's that's all we're really doing in terms of like IT online tool but that what what Paul showed that that's really really cool and I I can see it more what how we could use that is we could create the roofing um, and then create the zonings because that's there's a current gap right now where we we can tell the client uh, the zone spacings, but we can't visually show it. And I think in a 3D way, it would be amazing. Hmm. Ivan, yeah, it's, can, it's... Just for our audience, can you explain what a bomb is? A bomb is short form for bill of materials. Good, thank you. Yeah. I, I like to always expand TLAs before we hit the yeah, three, yeah. three letter acronyms. It's interesting. <laughs> um, with, this, with, with this program, you can export a BOM. So... Oh, wow. So you can, if you build all your panels and you name them properly, you can create a library, Ivan, and of all your parts, and then you can give that to your clients who buy the program, so you don't have to maintain it. And then yeah. when they when they use those parts in the drawing, and then they need to press export BOM, it'll give you like sixty five brackets and ten rails and whatever else you need to use as a parts list. And you can yeah, easily okay. it comes out as an Excel file, so you could import it into another Excel file and do a lookup and then create a, a pick list. So you could spend a bit of time on it. I and wonder if they have an API that we could um, latch onto our current tool. Um, no, you, that... could prob you could probably write something. I mean, you can just export yep. a, a bomb and then your program could pick up the Excel file inside it. Yep, yep. It's really good for doing big roofs and complex sites with multiple roofs and angles and just checking if panels really fit because I've often seen customers quotes where there's panels like from gutter to gutter you know nowhere yeah. for the nowhere for the installer to sign to stand and even fit off the last panel without walking on the panels and this kind of gets rid of that overzealousness of salespeople. Uh, and then the we would have a word I'm to say guilty about of that <laughs> Yeah, oh, you'll be surprised, and then we'll get the email um, and saying, "Oh, how do we get into the two S zone? Is there any way we can make it happen? Please do yeah. your magic and stuff like that." Yeah. So, um, yeah, if anyone wants any help with that, if they want to install it and get trained on it, I can give you some, you know, a bit of help on the on the over the video conferencing. No, no charge for the first ten minutes, just to help anybody <laughs> out. But, <laughs> but um. But yeah, really useful. I'm, def I'm definitely going to have a play with it. Yeah, you can. There's actually a simpler version called uh, My My House, which is like two hundred dollars, which is a lightweight version that doesn't do quite as much stuff. If you if you can't afford the six hundred. Wow, uh, you've got me excited, like, like, Paul. I think I'm going to go and um, download it and give it a go straight after <laughs> this live stream finishes. I think you can download it for like a month free or something, free trial. Yeah, so. I saw it on the website. There's a demo yeah. version. So I'll just bring that link up again for those who... So gosh, we, we really should be getting a commission from uh, Arcad for this because <laughs> it's a big plus, they, but they, it's a great they tool. Offered, they offered me to be a distributor for them and, and I'd, I'd buy it at a better price and sell it on, but it's got too many things on my plate right now. Yeah, <laughs> but I thought yeah. it's good for people to know they need something that's in between 
drawing on my bit of paper and full blown ARCAD or AutoCAD that you can't afford or can't drive. It's good in between. Cool. Um, now, uh, Paul, I might just bring the focus back to Paul for a tick and, and drop you back into uh, the green room, if you don't mind, Ivan. Yeah, sure. Okay, so let's click on there. We go. <laughs> it's funny, you know, I'm kind of playing uh, playing presenter here. Uh, <laughs> turn that off. So um, th you've shown us some really interesting things there. You know, some software solutions. You've talked a bit about um, some of the projects that um, Avio have been involved in. So everything from Passive Hulse uh, to the UCB. Uh, what else have you got up your sleeve, Paul? Oh, uh, we're doing a lot of software development at the moment and um, circuit board design. This is not our design, but we actually connect to it. This is a, a, um, a balancer. So whenever you have cells in series, if they're any kind of battery apart from lead acid, you need to balance the cells. This particular one's got three large supercapacitors here and a whole bunch of FETs. And what it does is it shifts the energy from the high cell to the low cell continuously. This one can push five amps. So basically five amps gets drawn into this set of capacitors and then it pushes it into the low cell afterwards and then it's monitored um, using uh, RS-485 by this connection here. So yeah, balances part of the battery systems. And um, this, this might need a bit of explaining, like why do you need to balance cells? Well, in particular the cells we use, I mean all cells needed to be balanced so that when you charge them, they keep at the same voltage. So if you have a series connection of say 24 cells and you charge them all at the same rate, every cell is slightly more imperfect than the, than, than the next one along. There's always going to be a small difference. They can't, be, they can't be exactly the same. And therefore you need to continually correct the lower voltage cell with the higher voltage cell so that they end up mm -hmm. being the same. So when you charge them in series, you don't overvolt a cell or undervolt a cell. So it's, it's about protecting every cell in the group. And the faster you charge and the faster you discharge, the more you need to balance because they can go out of sync more because of the flow of current. So the bigger the balance, the better. And that particular one does five amps. So it can so, move a lot of energy. So some balances really just waste a bit of energy to bring everything into balance. But this particular is a more active balancing system. It moves energy, is that correct? Yeah, it, it, it continually works. So. Yeah, for example, my car, I've got a PHEV, which has got a, uh, a lithium-ion battery pack inside it, and the balancing method there is to turn on a resistor on any cell that gets high. So you just basically waste off the extra voltage as heat, and, uh, but in this case, we actually shift the energy into a supercapacitor, then we empty it back into the cell again. So it's less energy wasted. So it only, only runs on about one or two watts, this device, this, um, this control board for, for, for uh, the energy required to control the FETs on here. And the supercapacitors are almost 100% efficient, almost, in storing energy and putting it back into the other cells. So you're not really wasting any energy. Whereas other balances that waste heat off, they waste energy and they also, the, the faster you run them, the more you waste. Right, so th this is the balancer that's in your UCB battery. Yeah, we have, we have two different methods of balancing, we use uh, an AC bus balancer where we basically convert DC to AC and share it across all cells and then they balance across that bus. And this is um, a more advanced one which allows us to do cell level monitoring. So uh, for example, we've got a battery here that we've been cycling 13 times per day for almost one year now. Um, it's sitting at 45 degrees. We're basically trying to destroy the battery. We've been unsuccessful. Um, we've lost about maybe five or six percent of its nameplate uh, rating over that one year period, which is a simulation of 11 years. So, and the heat that's coming out of the pack is really just the resistance of the cells and the resistance of the bus bars and cabling. And that's what's bringing it up to 45 degrees. So we're running a battery at 45 degrees continuously, but the key here is that the monitoring system is via the balancer. So we can see every cell and we use this that as a trigger to stop the charge and discharge. So the balance is trying to correct all the cells. If any cell goes outside the cell allowable range, the software says, I can see a cell going out. I can't correct fast enough. You're trying to charge me faster than I can balance. Therefore, I'll tell the inverter to stop charging and then I'll call that a day for a little while until everything catches up and then I'll allow discharge again. And we're doing the cycling test. Right, so that, that allows you to squeeze every bit out of those cells safely. 
Yeah, exactly. We don't want to overheat the cells. We don't want to under, under, undervolt them. So they're pretty resilient cells, but you know, you, you can't run them up to four or five volts per cell. That's not what they're designed to do. And having a monitored platform allows us to protect it. So, Paul, we've got a couple of questions. One from John, which is, uh, he's just in the green room, so he typed it in here. What is special about the supercapacitor as compared to normal capacitors? Uh, a lot more energy density. So these particular ones here, are I'm not sure the maker of these ones, but they come on with the balancer. So this is a 150 farad capacitor. Now, if you look up the size of a normal capacitor, it might be 150 microfarads. There's 150 farads, so it's a, uh, it's a million times more <laughs> energy that's, storage. That's, that's where the super comes in. So the super comes <laughs> from, yeah. Oh, cool. So basically, and... yeah, that's what they are. And from Brendan, we've got the question, are the components in the balancer designed with a high MTBF? Oh, oh my favourite word. I love MTBF. Yeah. Why don't they have STCs connected to MTBF? I do not know. Can you can you expand <laughs> that acronym? Uh, mean time between failure is MTBF. Um, STCs is small-scale technology certificates, as you know. I think that inverters that fail in five years shouldn't be allowed to claim 15 years worth of STCs. I always struggled with that. So... I think they should have MTBF on STCs on the whole system. But anyway, uh, the MTBF on this board here, the capacitors, they'll do you know, a million cycles or even more. So they're an extremely reliable product. These are all standard FETs. So digital FETs like this, they'll do a million cycles as well. So really the other components on there are very basic. You know, you've got small capacitors on here. Depending on how much work they're doing, they might last 10, 15, 20 years, depending which is why we monitor the whole platform. So if any part ever had a fault, we'd know because our software platform requires that we can see all cells cycling in order to allow the inverter to charge. So if a board ever didn't report, we could just replace the board. The board just plugs in via a socket here and by the connectors here. Wow, impressive. Um, so oh, we've got uh, we've got Dave Petrie from New Zealand joined us uh, in the in the green room. I Hi, might uh, I might bring you on in a bit, Dave. So um, I'm just uh, I've got a sort of little window where I can see what we call the green room, where people who are not live um, are sitting to come on, um, <laughs> and they they're chatting to each other right now. Um, so just on this thing of balancing, I don't know, Paul, if you saw um, my toolbox tech talk on Sunday with a company with um, right. Yuri Battens from Reelectrify. Uh, a Melbourne-based okay. technology company. They, they came up with a system where they um, individually construct a sine wave from cells, no inverter. So they're switching cells to create a sine wave. And I was thinking, wow, yeah. that, that really did my head in. Um, so that's, that's very a, clever, that's, yeah. Yeah, and so oh. the, one of their kind of pitches is that every single cell is fully managed uh, to full capacity. Interesting, yeah. There's a lot of new ways to approach it. There's a yeah. company in Perth that makes an inverter that does something similar. I don't know how they do it. I don't know how they went, but they were trying to get it off the ground a few years ago. Um, ah, okay. Was it a microinverter or a full-sized inverter? No, a full-sized inverter. Yep. Yeah. But we've, yep. um, we've been looking at ways of doing this differently as well, like for military application, just for example, where you want and you need 100% reliability. The MTBF is the big part of that. So we looked at using Vicor, DC to DC converters, which can drop the cell voltage from the bus voltage from 48 to say 2.5 volts. Um, and we basically directly charge each cell using DC without charging them in series. We just charge them in series, but we charge them directly per cell in that method. It's just very expensive to do it. So your basic method is using the inductive charges. So we have the balancers. Then the next step up is the monitored balancer like this one here, the 5 amp one. And the next step up is cell level charging. And depending on the budget, you can do any of them. Right, cool. Um, so I'm just busy chatting away to the, to the people in the green room to see if they're ready. I don't know. Dave, um, did you want to come, come and join us on screen for a bit between calls? I know that you're a, a busy man there in uh, Ideal Electrical in New Zealand. <laughs> you can always give me a thumbs up if you're, if you're good to join. Okay, so just bringing Dave in, and there we go. Uh, have you got uh, audio, Dave? Yes, I can hear you fine. Great, Hi, we Dave. can hear you. <laughs> Hi, Dave. 
<laughs> so Dave, Dave's from ID Electrical. He's the uh, manager for PV. Is that correct? Yeah, it's um, it fall, all falls under the the solar and EV category. EVs um, as well now. Yeah, the EV charging requirements are, are growing. I think there's a greater uptake here than certainly in Australia as well. So it's uh, interesting times ahead. Yeah, it, Australia seems to be the last place in the world that thinks EVs are a good idea. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's always interesting when you start reading comments about commentary on EVs. The, the, the rabid dogs come out and start saying how terrible it is and it's a bad idea and it'll never work. And the rest, while well, the rest of the world seems to be just getting on and doing it. Yeah, so you, you're talking to a bunch of EV enthusiasts here. So Paul's had a, a, a PHEV for, what, five years now? Almost seven years. Seven years. I like the fact that you told me you, you normally turn your cars over every about every three years, but you like this one so much you just hung on to it. Yeah, I've changed the tyres twice. On it. First time I ever bought tyres for a car. My rule was if the tyres wore out, you just take it back to the dealer and get another one. You know, that was disposable world. Now this car was too good, so it's the third set of tyres. So, and now it's about to be handed down to my daughter. <laughs> All right. So, so uh, have you got another EV or PHEV lined up? Yeah, I've already booked the 2022 PHEV Mitsubishi. Ah, you should have a look at nice. it. It's amazing. Yeah, beautiful car. I, I had one of those for a short period of time, but the requirement of one of the one of the things I found myself doing regularly was towing a big trailer, and it, it just did not like that at all. So, you know, you you got to appreciate this different EVs for different applications and yeah, you know, the, right. the one size one size does not fit all but you know if, if I was commuting to work and back each day it'd be a beautiful vehicle to own. yeah that's right so Dave you might need Paul's UCB upgrade uh, for the PHEV <laughs> Outlander I, I did design one recently <laughs> double the range and unlimited power <laughs> And it just slotted in between the wheel arches, I remember you telling me. That's right, yep. I haven't built it yet, I've just designed it. That's my next job next in my spare time. <laughs> in between uh, drawing and ARCAD, yep. Yep. So, Dave, um, tell us a bit about what, what uh, Ideal, uh, the X, do in New Zealand. So we're, we're, we're part of the Rexel family globally. Um, I think I'm one of something like 30,000 employees. Um, there's roughly, roughly 400 of us here and across 48 branches. And we, I started with the business almost three years ago. Um, and at that time we were, I guess it's fair to say we were dabbling in the, in the solar wholesale supply market. Um, and now we're taking that very seriously and it's grown, uh, it continues to grow um, and is, to be a very strong part of our, our, our business mix. So it's it's uh, it's enough to keep me occupied, uh, but you know, in terms of our entire business, it still is uh, a very small proportion of it. Um, you know, it's, we're still heavily involved in you know, cable and conduit and switchboards and so on to, to uh, electricians on a daily basis. That's still our core business and, and lighting and that, that sort of thing as well. So um, I, uh, we need to keep perspective sometimes we we think we're sometimes think we're a bit more bigger or a bit more important than we are but and it's it, it's a small market but it's growing and uh, we're we're seeing a lot of parallels um well certainly i am anyway from having seen the the takeoff of the industry in australia we've just seen the the parallels between uh the two markets um, that was actually my next question is roughly i reckon they're about 10 years apart that's yep. it's, that's about where I, I've seen it. So, uh, so one of the big differences for New Zealand is there there isn't um, any sort of government incentives like Australia has with STC. There, there isn't directly, but uh, and there is some question over how long um, one of the benefits will stick around for. They have a they have a system here called uh, low user. So if you if you are a low user of power, then you pay a very small connection uh, connection cost. So it's a bit of a loophole the solar industry takes advantage of. 
um, for some residential customers, not all. Um, but if you, oops, sorry, I'm wobbling this my makeshift table. Uh, if you can get under that, if you can sort of get under that usage level and get onto what they call their low user rates, it's it's a benefit to the customer of something around five hundred dollars a year, which you know you can consider that effectively a rebate because you know that's equivalent of five grand over ten years. That's not a bad outcome. Yeah, I'm just looking it up. It's uh, it's eight megawatt hours per year and below is considered a low user. Yes, but there's talk of getting rid of it. So whether that, whether the, the you know the it's one of those unintended consequences. You know the, the that was that was created to help the the people in the community that weren't actually using a lot of power and to to make them to force them to have uh, cheaper connection charges. It's just one of those unintended consequences that the solar industry plays into. So there is talk of getting rid of it. So just to put those numbers in kilowatt hours per day, that's 21.9. So yeah. basically 22 kilowatt hours per day and below is a low energy user, which ironically yeah. is the national average for Australia. Um, New Zealand's slightly higher, I believe, because more thermal. Yeah, so you more. don't actually have to put a lot of solar onto most people's yeah. homes with hot water diversion to get them well under that number. Yep. And they're paying something like thirty-five cents a day as a low energy user for connect for a utility. Yeah, it's about like it's about ten bucks a month instead of yeah, um, you know, a free for all. You know, some customers are paying maybe up to almost two dollars a day. You know, it's sixty dollars a month for a connection charge. Yep. Um, you're quite easily saving fifty dollars a month. You know, six hundred dollars a year. Um, so yeah, while there's no rebate, that's that's not a bad outcome, and it's ongoing forever. It's not just a one one off hit. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but the other thing you know I, I mentioned before with New Zealand is there's no sort of direct solar incentives other than being a low energy user. How do you think that changes the market from your experience in Australia? I think it's wonderful. Um, I, I call it the unmolested market. Um, it's people are actually doing it for the right reasons, and they're doing it, um, and they're sizing it. It's like people are sizing systems correctly. It's not just a case of 6.6 .6 kilowatts for everybody. Um, the systems are being designed to give the right yield for the right for the for that customer. So it's and of course you know if you don't if you don't have to put as big a system on then this it's not as much outlay. So it makes it that much more affordable. Yeah, actually, Paul, you were just having a grumble about STCs not having a, a, a mean time between failures requirement. Um, I like to think of <laughs> STCs in Australia, small scale technology certificates are a bit like the first home buyer's grant. You just get given the cash and if it works, it works. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. It's just a cash handout that with not much policy thought went into it um, over 20 years ago. So well, yeah. you can you can remember all those years ago, the debate about having, you know, the, any kind of wrecks at the time or you know whatever it was tied into the yield of the system but you know that was deemed to be you know too much work or too hard to audit or too hard to manage or and, you know you've got the system you have yep now um i've got norm anderson from energy smart water in the green room and norm i don't know if you're ready but um you you wanted to talk a bit about heat recovery too because paul was touching on that um so dave i might just drop you back into the green room so you can talk to your customers <laughs> good one i've actually got a phone call right here <laughs> there we go all right back to work all right so um norm Good morning, Glenn. Good morning, uh, Paul. How are you? Okay, Norm. I was listening to your uh, comments earlier about uh, passive homes and heat recovery and the likes, and uh, I just yeah. thought we could probably add a bit of uh, scope in there with Energy Smart Water. We've been doing a lot of those sort of projects internationally and in Australia over the last probably 20 plus years, but um, we've been involved in the largest passive home project in the Southern Hemisphere being uh, student accommodation at Monash Uni with uh, and it's, a lot of it's about removing um, gas from systems as well, which brings into play the electrical technologies that we have at the moment, but also a lot of heat pumps. And our uh, NMAX tank, formerly Rotex, is probably a good uh, thermal battery, which we call a thermal battery with our electrical systems that we have, but also for 
heat recovery off multiple sources and um, and also offering we can take heat recovery into the tank but we can take other heat sources back out as, as well so I was just interested in um, some of your discussions around um, heat recovery from waste hot heating, heating water we've played in that space a bit um, in the past as well and probably just more showing options of our product it's not just only uh, an electric hot water tank or vessel we can actually do a lot of many other we call it a, a, a web of energy we can bring multiple heat sources in and take multiple heat sources out so we've got projects on islands in fiji where we're taking heat recovery off the generator um radiator jacket and making hot water so we're providing power and hot water to the whole whole island so, uh, but looked a lot in um waste heat recovery from shower blocks from uh laundries we've got some big laundries operating in in europe we're making massive savings um even in the rubbish removal area where they take making hot water from crack units from the computer rooms and everyone that's in the rubbish refuse trucks has to come back and have a shower before they go home part of their policy and all the hot water is generated pretty much from just waste energy that there's so much of it out there that don't really take a lot of um not a lot of consideration for but in today's market it's really starting to pick up and open up people's eyes Yeah, it does sound very much like um, you need to be a bit of a crime scene investigator when it comes to recovery of heat, all those possible wastages that you can capture. Um, uh, but what about cooling? Is there kind of like an, a reverse? Like if you're in the tropics, is there a, a cool recovery yeah. system? We are. We've done um, Cobar Hospital. We've had a problem with the town's main coming into the hospital being at 40 degrees C, and um, they couldn't do dialysis with this hot water. So we're actually cooling the water with our tank Back to, to main spread temperature around 20 degrees and, and achieving that we're doing some work with uh, some supermarkets around chilling with um, uh, stopping the, the compressors from icing up or the, the, um, the radiators from icing up and putting energy back into the tank we also do as Paul was mentioning or I think you did Glenn air to air heat transfer is another product that we have so we're engaged with uh, Woolworths at the moment, taking heat recovery off a flatbread oven out to atmosphere and transferring um, fresh air and putting the heat back into the store. So we have a range of those products available um, and engineers and design team that can pull, pull something through if anyone's interested, as well as injecting, you know, in this uh, discussion, PV energy into the tank as well, excess energy into the tank. Yeah, yeah, which is something that, uh, you know, when you first introduced me to it, I got very excited because a lot of people and more and more people are being limited by utilities in terms of how much inverter capacity they can connect uh, to the to the network, which therefore affects how much PV they can put on their roof, unless they have battery storage. And battery storage is quite expensive still um, for residential installations. But being able to heat water directly with photovoltaic panels, not thermal panels, that's that's pretty exciting. One of the discussions we've had with um, a lot of end users recently is the fact that they want to get off the grid. And if they've got a similar thing to what we've done at your place, Green with a wet back system, we can put the wet back into the tank in winter to make sure they've got plenty of heat. But we can also add to that because we've got the solar contribution, but we can add into the fact that if the wood fire is going and your living room is nice and warm, we can also stick another coil in and put a few radiators in your bedroom and, and heat it at the same time. So, or floor heating, whatever you want to do. I think that's similar to what you're doing at your place. So there's always that added, we can bring multiple energies in and we can take multiple energies out of the tank. Actually, I've got a question for you um, from my partner. She asked me last night, um, how, how long ago was hydronic heating invented? Um, uh, hydronic heating probably if you go to the roman baths over in um in england yep. there was hydronic heating back many 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 years ago in, in the form of running through um channels underneath the, the floor of the saunas but um i'm not too sure it's been around for a long time it hasn't been a big uptake in, in australia as much as europe um europe it's everywhere but uh, because it's more cl colder climate but today being um, that type of heating, which is clean heating, um, you don't have the dust particles blowing around, especially with our COVID issue we got at the moment. So whether it's an electric floor heating, we can do that with the Actor product as well, um, or it's hydronic. It's a it's a good for clean form of heating, and your feet are nice and warm, as you know, Glenn. When you take your socks off, you haven't got a cold floor floor below your feet. So so it's quite it's predominantly here in luxury homes, more 
more of an uptake, but it's starting to get a bit more traction these days. Yeah, uh, look, I, I just love um, hydronic heating in this climate, which is you know alpine, subalpine Victoria, where it's seven hundred meters. So it does it does get cold and stay cold outside. But you know, if you're in in a, let's say northern New South Wales, you might have a cold snap. It doesn't last. So it's not for everyone because you can't get rid of the heat as quick as you can put it in. So no, exactly. Yeah, so you got to sort of choose your climate zone. But you're right; it is a wonderful, um, you know, feeling to have a warm floor. I often say that concrete has got three things that are bad about it: it's hard, it's cold, and it's rough. Well, if you polish it, it's not rough, and if you heat it, it's uh, not cold, but it's still hard. You still break things. <laughs> also, if you heat it, it becomes another battery. Yep. Yep. You know, so you've got a, a thermal battery, a battery in your floor and your power battery and your panels on a roof and you've pretty much got a, a, a really good solution. Yeah. Now, Paul, I see um, you've got a shared screen in the green room I can see. Is that um, something you yeah. wanted to share? That's just the um, drain recovery unit. You want to pull it up on screen? Yeah, I'll bring it up on screen. So here we go. Just It just explains how it works. So as the water goes down the drain and the water's coming in, to, a bath is probably a bad example. A shower is a better example because the shower water is coming down, heating up the pipe, and the cold water coming in to replenish the tank is being preheated. So you're recovering, you know, depending on the model, the brand of the drain water recovery unit, you can get up to 80%, maybe 70% of the heat that's going down the drain that would otherwise have gone out to the sewer is going back in to preheat the water coming to your tank. And that might mean you could avoid having a heat pump if you couldn't use a heat pump for some reason, like, for example, in an apartment. Yeah. Um, there's also another product by a group called Microheat. They're in uh, Mount Waverley, I think, or Clayton, maybe. And they make this really awesome little um, uh, instantaneous electric heater, which is available as a one-phase, single-phase or three-phase unit. It's a tiny little thing. It's only about so big. And um, it, it doesn't... Chili pepper, is it called? No, that's different again. The, the chili okay. peppers are, yeah, so the, the microheat is a instantaneous electric heater that uses the water as the as the uh, electrode for heating the water. So it relies on the ionized, ionized water to heat it up. So there's no element to wear out, basically. So they last a really long time. They're inefficient because they're just a resistive heater. But if you add it to a, a drain recovery unit, your inefficiency is only limited to say 30 seconds so you turn the shower on and it heats up the water starts flowing down the drain at 32 degrees it's preheating the water coming to the microheat heater which means it's only bringing it from 32 back up to say 37 degrees or 40 degrees depending on your shower so therefore it's probably as efficient as a heat pump and you can put it under your under the bench in a in a bathroom which means you have water straight away so you'd have to wait for the water to travel through the pipe so it's actually a water saving device as well as a water heating device because a lot of people run the hot tap until it's hot yeah. and so waste a lot of water. Exactly. And you might have a shower 25 metres down the other end of the house and you don't want to put another heater in. You could use one of these instantaneous heaters uh, along with the drain recovery unit and you'll end up with an overall outcome similar to a heat pump but without the burden of a heat pump if you can't fit one in or it doesn't work for you. So then you store your energy in batteries instead. This might be a norm question, but is there any plumbing complexities to having, because it sounds like it'll have to have a loop, so it's got to be able to reverse the, the hot water back into the cold? No. Sorry, the, the preheat water back into the... No, into so the, that, the, the cold water coming into the system is the cold water at the bottom. Um, and you, all you're doing, instead of bringing the water in at 15 or 20 degrees, you might be picking it up to 30, and that replenishes the supply that goes into the tank. We do a little bit differently. We played around with this sort of stuff as well, but we do it a little bit differently internally of the tank. But we're looking at some dairy models at the moment where waste water going down the drains at 80 degrees C and transferring it through our tank in a titanium coil, pushing like we do with mechanical heat recovery, pushing it through the top, heat it, heating from the top down and then dragging the coldest water back out to go to waste. So um, I'd be interested to catch up with Paul and show him what we do. Um, in, in large scale projects as well, they could be homes or they could be um, large scale projects. And I think we've mastered it fairly well, um, but there's a lot of opportunity in that space because it's just waste heat, waste energy just going straight down the drain. I think the other thing is that high temperature waste is a big concern for um, our infrastructure network because it can damage the infrastructure. So normally you'll have to put a cooling pit in the system to, to cool it down, especially in a commercial laundry or a kitchen or something. 
and um, and then send it to the sewer at, at a desirable temperature so it doesn't affect the infrastructure. But when we start dragging heat recovery off those things, we can also maybe get rid of the cooling pit, which is another re reduction in cost. So, uh, but you're a local, Paul. You're in Melbourne, or yeah, we're in Mitcham. Okay, in Melbourne. Yeah, we'll get get you down to Dramana when we get, we're allowed to travel again, mate, and have a look at what we're doing. I like it down there. I like Dramana. It's nice down there. Yeah, we've got the uh, breweries all in the industrial centre now, so uh, okay. <laughs> come down and do a bit of a tour. <laughs> Sounds good. Cool. Um, so I see Dave's off the phone again. So Dave, did you want to pop back in? And we might um, just answer a few final questions um, with all the all the uh, the guests on screen. So thumbs up if you're available. Yep. Okay, I'll just bring it back in. So here's uh, here's the whole team. Well, a full international. Uh, well, th three in Melbourne, one in uh, Auckland, New Zealand. Um, how's the weather there, Dave? Oh, it's it's lovely. It's, it's like the French Riviera every day. <laughs> I mentioned the other day, Glenn. We were um, contacted by a consultant from New Zealand. I think it is in Auckland for a social housing project, where they want to implement our actor product into. Uh, the hot water unit in, I think it's about 200 apartments. They're all going to have an individual uh, hot water unit in each apartment. And we'll be injecting through one act or I, single phrase, one kilowatt of excess power into each tank at the bottom of the tanks, which will be free to the social housing community. And the top element will be charged at, uh, build it, and they pay for that one. So, so this starting to get some interesting, um, innovative ideas popping out of New Zealand back this way as well. I'm just trying to understand that one. So they get a guaranteed certain amount of free hot water, and then yep. and then beyond that they pay. Yeah. So any excess power that's available during the day will go through um, PLC and be managed in in four buildings of about 50 apartments. They've got about 50, 60 kilowatts on the roof. So while no one's at home, the excess power will generally be shift sitting there doing nothing. So they're going to put it into the tank. Hopefully heat all the tanks up, and then any excess required they'll pay for. Right. It's quite an interesting concept. So uh, we've got some drawings. I probably haven't got it with me, but um, I'm happy to share it with you next time if you like. Yeah, cool. I don't know if you've heard of that one, Dave. No, there's a lot of incentives or well, not incentives. There's a lot of um, programs focused on community housing here. And yeah. uh, hot water is a real obvious one because it, it's typically... 25, 30% of the, the energy costs for most homes. And yeah. most homes here still have conventional tanks. Um, gas isn't overly widespread. So they had a lot of houses still have just conventional cylinders. This is a government funded project too, Dave. Um, yeah. So yeah, um, yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a truckload of money being thrown around at the moment in that space. Yes. Yeah, cool. All right. Well, um, I'm, I'm just checking that I haven't missed any questions from the uh, the remote audience, and uh, I think we've we've probably covered all those ones. So maybe we'll just do a bit of a wrap then. So just to, once around the room, and uh, we'll we'll finish this live stream. But uh, cool. starting starting with uh, Paul. Hi and bye. Is ah, that what you want? Is that what you want, or you want to actually say something? Yeah, as you wish. Well. If anybody needs any help with uh, design software, we can point them in the right direction. You can come and see us. We're in Mitcham. We'll give you a bit of a pointer on how to use it. And while you're here, you can have a look at our battery technology and our software platform, which is really good for off-grid projects and heavy, high-powered usage projects. So come and visit us. We're just in Mitcham, RV Australia. Great. Good one. Thanks, Paul. Norm. Yeah, just like to say thanks again, Glenn. Same, um, anyone that's interested in catching up with us at Dramana, uh, welcome to do so. We probably post online as well when we're mobile with our off-grid trailer that we've set up with uh, a lot of the products actually working in it. So, uh, you know, we're, I've got to get back to New South Wales. Um, I've got to, I was supposed to have a meeting this afternoon with uh, Andrew Mears, but um, unfortunately I can't get across the border, so we'll be doing a Zoom. But I need to get back up to New South Wales to bring the trailer back for a, uh, trade show hopefully later in the month but um, anyone's welcome to come and see us um, if we can help you in any way as I said we've got plenty of um, uh, 
engineers, both electrical and mechanical on hand, and we've got 27 years of experience in, in what we do. So uh, probably seven years in solar, in the solar PV sort of market, but thermal solar, 27 years, and, and many, many other technologies as well. But thanks once again, Glenn. No worries. Thanks, Norm. And Dave? Thanks, thanks for having me. Um, I'm absolutely gutted not to be in Melbourne this week seeing family, but uh, after after weeks and weeks of build up, it, uh, Victoria's pulled the pulled the old lockdown trick again on us. So we'll uh, we'll see how we go again in another another month or two. But uh, 20, 23 years or something in this industry um, in battery industrial batteries and, and PV, you know, it, the technology and and ideas and the people in it just never cease to amaze me. It's a, it's a, it's a pretty good game to be in, I think. And yep. I'm looking forward to getting back to New Zealand, Dave. So you've been trying to yeah. get me over there for about two years now. I know. <laughs> yeah. All we'll, right. We'll get well, there. Good. Good one. Well, well, thanks. Thanks, everyone. I'll just uh, fare you well, send you the green room, and just do my little outro. outro. Thanks, for, thanks, Glenn, for doing this. Okay. See you, Paul. Your norm, and uh, there we go. Okay, so yeah, um, that was another lockdown live stream. Gee, I've done one uh, every day since Monday. It, it's uh, been fun. I got my kids really well organised. They just do their uh, their schoolwork in the room next door. Occasionally, um, poke their head through the window so the internet's not working, Dad. Um, but uh, hopefully, we'll get back to normal or normality soon. Please, please. But I'll be back tomorrow with another, in fact, it's the last in this series, uh, live stream lockdown with some other guests. So if you enjoyed this, uh, this show, come back 10 o'clock Melbourne time tomorrow and we'll do it all over again. Okay, thanks a lot. See ya.